Hello, and welcome to the program, Woke Up, where we amplify the voices of former critical social justice warriors, those that were seduced by the woke ideology, that were leftists, and they were brought to a place where they did not want to be. And if that was you or you know a friend that uh, uh, has a great story that we'd like to amplify, we'd love to hear from you and look in the show notes how to contact us because we're not just looking for famous people, but we're looking for ordinary people that uh, have uh, lived in a, 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 a life in which they were brainwashed and they were in the cult. And so today I'm really excited about our guest. Uh, she's made an incredible impact and she is the... Uh, uh, communications director of an organization called uh, Gays Against Groomers, which is making a big impact because just like, as we know, the woke ideology seeks to co-opt everything in its path. And uh, they've co-opted uh, the LGBT uh, movement. And so on our show is Judith Rose uh, calling in from Arizona. So Judith, uh, welcome to the show. And I got a just a question from you. If, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what were you like as a young woman? How did you get sucked into the woke ideology? Hey, Michael, thanks for having me. So, um, yeah, my name is Judith Rose. And um, as of, uh, I think it was at the end of last year, I became the director of communications for Gay Skin Screamers. And it's been a really eye-opening experience. It's been an awesome experience because I really feel like I'm part of something historical that's going to be on the record for a really long time. But um before that, in 2020, a lot happened to me. I was in a pretty negative place in my life. I was pretty lost. And it had a lot to do with like the people I was surrounding myself with and the things that I was paying attention to. And, you know, I think I was really just eating up the propaganda. It's, it's, it sucks you in, you know, especially when you're feeling vulnerable. And I was in, I was in a bad place mentally. And I was depressed and anxious and angry about a lot of things. I felt like, you know, the world was going in the wrong direction, but I didn't, and it is, and don't get me wrong, but I didn't see it the way I see it now. I saw it in the way that the narrative wanted me to see it, but I didn't fully realize that. So at the time um, I was going to, I, I went to a handful of like BLM rallies and, and protests and Something just felt off about it. And especially when COVID hit, I really started to ask a lot of questions because the logic of what we were doing to deal with it was starting to not make any sense to me. And I started to question that, but um, it was also an election year and we were seeing all the BLM stuff happening and George Floyd happening. And I was just getting like alarm bells, that, like something's just not quite right. And with COVID, I was working at a dispensary at the time in, in Mesa in Phoenix, and everything about my job changed in order to deal with COVID, and it took a lot of the joy out. Not to mention, I mean, a couple things about the industry kind of ruined it for me, but I just, I ended up deciding to leave my job and take a look at the world around me a little bit closer. So I watched a few documentaries. I watched a show called Patriot Act by Hassan Minaj. And there was this one episode that was really impactful for me because he talked about who owns the media and uh, how will they all sort of fall under this umbrella of only a few companies. And over time, it's even less companies. And I started to see how they can pull the strings on the newspapers and the media that come out, especially to protect people like Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, Vanity Fair did this whole piece on, on him to make him look like some kind of philanthropic hero and covered for him when people tried to call them out for it. So that, that everything that happened with Epstein was also a huge wake up as well. And it, it all happened kind of at the same time, which was a lot for me to deal with. So I had to zoom out, I had to look at things, you know, inside out. I had to ask myself, okay, well, where did I get my opinions? Are they really my opinions? And you know, it was a lot of internal work that I had to consciously decide to do. And that led me on kind of a spiritual journey as well. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. You have to make that conscious choice. You have to examine your thoughts um, as if they're clouds passing by, you know, like they're not your own and decide what you want to entertain or not. And I, I had to re-examine everything. I mean, and a lot of my views pretty much changed. Everything went inside out for me because as I started to examine everything that I believed in, 
it just, a lot of it flipped because I saw the world in a different light. I appreciated life in a different way. I started to understand how these social justice movements were weaponizing people, especially people who were emotionally charged. You know, a lot of this stuff is just propaganda to keep you in like this agitated state of emotion. So you're let you, people don't really want to critically think they want to be told how to feel and how to think. And they may not realize that, but they do because everyone's so busy all the time. You know, when they've got you in this grind and this hamster wheel, you don't want to sit there and take the time to, to think about whether or not the news is actually telling you the truth. You just sort of take it. And that's what I was doing. I was bouncing around uh, news headlines a lot, but all the mainstream stuff, trying to be informed. And uh, in a lot of the ways it's, um, people on that, in the social justice movements and people who are kind of leftists, they, they do care in their own way. And that's the problem. They, they have these intentions that are like, well, they, they want it better. They want progress. They want, you know, they, they want things to move forward and that's easily capitalized on, especially when they're in a, in a constant state of aggravation with everything going on. So again, I had to really ask myself if the, what I believed in was truly what I believed in. And I realized that it, it wasn't. And the left really pushed me away too, because they, they started to see the extremes of what they were doing. And I felt like I had no choice, but to, you know, leave the party, register as independent and, and decide from here on out to examine, you know, politicians individually, first of all, and their policies and, everything about them, not just grab on to one thing that they say that I like, you know? And so that led me to undoing a lot of feelings I had about Trump when I realized that I was, I had believed a lot of out of context things that the media was weaponizing and trying to use against him. And I started to understand how fake news works. And suddenly that made sense to me. So it was, it was a lot because I was one of those people that believed the headlines about him and at face value and, and all that stuff. But I started to see what he'd actually done for the black community, what he'd actually done for the gay community. He was pro LGBT. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that, but they just believe these like salacious headlines at face value. And I, I was like, I can't do that anymore. I can't do this anymore because it just makes me upset. And I think that's the point, you know, because then you're more irrational. You're less likely to make your own decisions. You're less likely to think things through and that's kind of more or less what they want. So then they want you to take this energy and put it into these social justice movements that they themselves designed to divide people and confuse people and just keep that going because the the actual enemy is not each other, but it's a very small group of people who've been running things for a very long time. And, and you were you were really angry as a young woman. Uh, yeah. You hated Trump. You... Mm -hmm. You were an activist. You were a lefty. And uh, for a decade, you, you had talked about, why do you describe your mental health during uh, that period of your life uh, prior to uh, waking up? Well, I mean, I the thing is, I've struggled with the depression and, and anxiety since I was a teenager. But, um, you know, looking back, what what one interesting thing I like to tell people is because I started to, because of my partner, I started to learn about how hormones work. And I realized that right around the time that I woke up, I stopped taking um, birth control, which can really mess with your body. But I'd taken it for so long that I didn't know the difference. I didn't remember what life was like without it. Um, because I'm 32 now. And I think I got off of it when I was around 28, 29. And I think I started it when I was about 14. So that's a long time. So I think part of what helped me reorient myself was the fact that I wasn't on this pill anymore. And it, you know, it was, I guess, more or less making me kind of crazy and more irrational and more impulsive. And um, a lot of that has just slowed way, way, way down. Like, I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm perfect and I'm Zen all the time now because I'm still a human being, but um, I definitely feel a much greater sense of calm. And a lot of that had to do with my spiritual journey as well, because I, I reached a point where I, I found my faith and I started to get into that and read the Bible more and things made more sense to me. And that was a big step for me too, because um, at one point, I mean, I was raised Episcopalian, but at one point I walked away from that and I was like, 
interested in witchcraft and I had witch books on my shelf and things like that. And, and those all went into the garbage <laughs> at one point. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm, I'm totally done. Like, I'm just done because I, I see a lot of, you know, the, the energy that people ha are, have, have sort of let in and taken over them. I don't think they realize that it's kind of a demonic force. But I mean, that's sort of a whole other rabbit hole we could get into. But I, I really see this darkness in people that they believe is is some kind of righteousness. And it's, it's twisted to be able to see that and discern that. But um, yeah, I've had to really, really slow everything down. And, and like I said, I do still struggle with some things, but it's nothing like it was when I was in that state of mind. And when I consciously made that decision, you know, I started to go on a little journey. And I don't think that journey's ended by any means. But it's a work in progress. I like to tell people I'm a recovering liberal, <laughs> you know, yeah. because it's, it's a work in progress, but I feel so much better than I used to. And I, having the faith I have now makes all the difference because I didn't have any sense of that direction. If I was sadder or upset, I would just internalize it instead of trying to find something to comfort me like I can now. I, I am in agreement with you. Uh, uh, I have a Christian worldview and like the scriptures say that uh, Satan disguises himself as a as an angel of light. Exactly. And there's this allure, this illusion, this temptation that everything's going to be good with pr the progressive policies. If we tear down the system, mm -hmm. if we, we bring in, uh, we fight against social justice and we bring in equity and uh, the, the whole system has to be done away with uh, in order for this new utopia to come in. And uh, behind it is just brings chaos and hurt and narcissism and oh, yeah. absolute destruction of everything around it. And uh, I think you, you began to see that and you began to put on a new lens and, and uh, I saw the, uh, the, the video of you the first time. And, and this is not, I'm not saying this is a Republican Democrat thing, but I definitely think there's dark forces. We look at the whole BLM movement you know, they'll say the name, they would do libations. They would uh, call upon the spirits of the dead. Yeah. There's a, a spiritual thing uh, uh, fueling it. And I don't know how with one mouth, you can say Black Lives Matter at the same mouth, you're burning down black communities and small businesses and causing destructions and, and mayhem in the, in the community. And what yeah. did BLM actually do for the African-American community? I, I, I don't see any evidence that they did anything. They took no. millions and millions of dollars and reaped chaos in the urban centers of America. How did that produce anything of good and virtue and value? I think some of them are realizing it now, but I was seeing it happen in real time because uh, the, a lot of people were talking about following the money. So that was something that I did. And, and a lot of the funding went back to Act Blue, to the Democrats, to George Soros, who seems to fund both sides of division a lot and make some money out of it. And, and he's quoted saying that he doesn't really care about the consequences. He just cares about opportunities, whatever makes him richer. That's it. So, and, and it was interesting because when I started to look at things like that and criticize these people, I got pushback from certain people in my life telling me that I shouldn't be criticizing that, especially George Soros. I was called anti-Semitic for criticizing him. I was like, well, if he's not a good person, it doesn't matter. Right? Like I'm not attacking his religion. I'm calling him out. But, it, and it was just the weirdest thing, that phenomenon of when I suddenly started being like, Hey, this isn't quite right. And look at the, the, the there were a few people that started to attack me and I lost a few friends, but after that, I just realized that they weren't really my friends. Now, did you have uh, friends that were uh, close to you, family members during that time of uh, radical leftism in your life? Uh, or did you, had you cut all those people out of your life? Did you have any sane voices in, in your mind or, or around you in your circle of influence? Um, there was nobody guiding me. I, I mean, I took it all upon myself and, um, Really, like the the only person that I had was was my mom because we were kind of distanced. But when all this happened to me, I started to talk to her about it and fix things with her, and um, I changed everything in my life. I mean, I pretty much cut everybody out. 
because like, you know, I, I was like, none of these people are actually my friends because they wanted to look down on me for what I was doing. They didn't, they thought, told me I was crazy. They told me I was a Nazi or a phobe or a bigot or whatever name they wanted to call me. And I was like, just for looking into things and like pointing things out and asking questions and saying like, Hey, did you know that these people control the media, which isn't necessarily a good thing. And that means they can do whatever they want. And, you know, and then I was questioning things with COVID and people were starting to look at me funny. And I was like, this is so weird. It's, it's, I started to feel like I was an invasion of the body snatchers and I, and they were, everyone was pointing at me and I was like, I gotta go, you know, it was, it's the strangest thing when that happens and everything shifts. Cause I didn't have a choice, but to really like walk away from everything around me at the time. So who were who some of the influencers that helped you to see things? I know you saw that, uh, that documentary, but, uh, you've, you, that must've been a really hard spot for you with all of your friends, your social network, everybody with well, one common voice with no freedom of speech or thought you're in this matrix, uh, but you, you got out of it. So why, why don't you talk us, to us about how did you get out of it? Uh, as you said, you didn't have anybody coaching you or mentoring you, uh, what happened during that period of time and how long did that take? Uh, I would say maybe three to six months. Um, and that was all of my own accord. And I was doing a lot of like praying and a um, couple of meditations. And I was looking for guidance more spiritually than anything. And that's really what pushed me forward. Um, you know, the other things I was noticing when I was absorbing all these documentaries, I mean, I, I watched uh, Out of Shadows. That was a big one for me. And then the the L.A. riots in 91, I think that was um that was a documentary I saw. I saw the patterns of BLM and how there's always some racial tension every single election year. Something seems to happen and it kind of just echoes through time. And it's like clockwork. And, um, you know, I didn't see that as as a, a thing that society was trying to push. I saw that as something that was being controlled and pushed on purpose. So I, I really had to absorb things. I absorbed things pretty quickly. Actually, some people kind of like asked me if I was okay because they were like, you, you took a lot in. I was like, I know, but I just, once you get to a certain point, you just need, I, I have this thirst for knowledge now, you know, and starting to get into philosophy and, and things like that. But um, it just required a lot of inner work and conscious choice. And because, I mean, you know, the, the, the mental health that I grew up with kind of was isolating as it is. So I, at the time I sort of felt like I didn't have anything to lose. I was just like, well, if you're not going to move forward with me, then, then you're not my friend. Then you don't, you, you know, like, you're not there for me. Okay, fine. And when I came out the other side, I mean, I, I have so many friends now and, and people that I, I like to think I'll know for a very long time over the experiences we've had together. And all that's been way more valuable than anything I ever had as a, as a leftist, you know, because you bond with people as a leftist really over negative things, over things that you hate, over things that you you want to change or things that you look down on and you 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 bond over being condescending and and it's just this energy that I didn't want anymore you know it's, moral outrage and tearing yeah. down the system yeah I mean but the other the, the thing is the is the further I went the more I started to see reflections on either side of the political aisle because it wasn't just like yes I got a little push to the right but then I got to examine the right and I saw a lot of the sim, a lot of similarities. Um, you know, both sides think they're correct. Both sides have a habit of trying to make the other look stupid or, or criticizing these small mm -hmm. movements and turning these, you know, molehills into mountains and, and just making fun of each other essentially endlessly, like trying to argue over who knows best or what's right, what's wrong. And they, they both think they're correct. Both sides can be condescending. Both sides can be immature. Um, and I, you know, I started to discover echo chambers on the right as well. And I was like, this, I purposely got out of the left to get away from this stuff. So I took a pretty big step back for a while. 
I mean, especially when Matt's health wasn't doing so well, I was just like, I don't, you know, I don't have time to constantly post and what everybody else is posting and what everybody else is saying. And that's one of the reasons I took a break from my podcast too, is because I didn't want to just be another echo chamber. Mm. Um, and I wanted to, when I, when I joined Gays Against Groomers, I wanted to really make a difference. And that had, it, it, it was a movement that I'd been looking for. I wanted something that resonated with me that I felt, you know, good enough to join that I felt like it was really going somewhere. Um, and it's, it's been interesting. I mean, we got to hit, we got to see Amfest in the first six months of the, the, you know, its inception. And that was a really, it was a trip for me because I'd been a Democrat basically since I was old enough to vote. And suddenly I was at a conservative convention with a gay group. <laughs> and, I was like, and it was, it was just mind blowing. Everyone was really nice. And, um, I had a lot of positive interactions. I met so many people, made friends and, um, I've been in touch with a lot of them ever since. So it's been, it's been a really rewarding experience. You know, I have no regrets. So now I just try to, to be a living example of like, Hey, you can come out of that and you don't necessarily have to go full on this side. They're going to, people are going to think that you do, they're going to call you names, but you, ha you don't have to care about that. So why do you tell us about gays uh, against groomers? Uh, it's uh catchy title uh, what, what tell us about the organization and what you're doing and and what the mission and vision is and and uh the, the, the activities you're involved with yeah so it was started by jamie michelle and she is a 100 percent jewish woman she's a lesbian obviously she was going by the gay who strayed she had a really big platform and she saw the the way that the gay community had has kind of very quickly like er eroded and, and seems to be headed in this direction that is taking away any scrap of dignity or respect some people had for the gay community and involving children. I mean, that's, that's where they're really crossing the line. So she started the movement. Um, I think it was June, 2022. And we, so I was in it by December and she invited me through Matt, actually. I had been writing videos for Matt to speak out about this stuff because he was, he came out that he was trans and then he had stopped taking the testosterone and everything happened with that. But um, uh, the, the whole point of the movement is to verbalize and get on record that we are against the indoctrination, medicalization, and sexualization of children being done specifically in the name of the LGBTQ community. Um, we're against the agenda in schools. We're against the excessive gay content. We're against the explicit content. We're against kids, you know, being at these parades that have a lot of sexual connotations and the way everything is just kind of breaking down into, you know, it, it was, it used to be pride of like same sex relationships. And that's a whole other subject than things you do in the bedroom. Those, those two are separate. And now they're kind of just, blended and they're involving children and they're trying to educate children younger and younger about these explicit things all in the name of, of acceptance and inclusivity. And it's, it's so demented really. And, and because it's so, it can be really difficult to get people to see that, like how inappropriate it is and how it interrupts child's development. And this new trend of, of trying to tell children, oh, look at all these different identities. You could be any of these. And if you're scared of puberty, just block it. It's so unnatural, and that just it just drew the line for me. So in this organization, our, our goal is to, I mean, it, we get into the legislation eventually as well, but the first step was awareness, of course. And uh, we've also got uh, our own Bill of Rights that we're looking into um, to getting signed. And it basically it would federally outlaw like child sex changes and puberty blockers for minors and classified drag as adult cabaret, no kids allowed um, and performances, things like that. And it's just, it's been really eye opening because I knew there was a problem when I joined the organization. And then I really got to see just how big of a problem it is from there because, you know, with the bigger we got, the more we could find and see and show each other. And it was just like, wow. Okay. So we've, we've gained a lot of momentum. We've been through some stuff, you know, granted, but, I'm I'm proud to be part of the movement, you know, because I I don't want to see things go go this direction, and I don't think all this stuff is necessary 
to find out who you are. And I think it takes time. I think kids need to just be left alone and have like yes. a neutral education. None of this stuff should be in their face. Nobody should be putting the, the, the pride flag over the American flag in their classroom. It shouldn't even be there. Like I, sh I just, I don't want to see so much divisive politicized stuff in these kids' classrooms. They don't need it. Yes. It yeah, the, the the gay rights movement and the homosexual community suffered and worked really hard. It took uh, decades mm -hmm. uh, to even hit, uh, be able to be married. And uh, it just seems like this woke ideology, uh, the spearheaded by the trans cult, which, which it is, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it just co-opted it. And, it's tearing it apart. And I've had on the show before Mary Lou Singleton and uh, Megan Murphy, who were, were, were feminists and uh, we lamenting uh, how the trans uh, ideology has gone into feminism and has just torn it apart. And yeah. I, I see this, I see this woke ideology tearing apart churches, institutions, families. It's a virus. It just seeks to take over. And, uh, and, and it, it will come in and latch in and it seeks to control and subjugate everything to it. And if it kills the organization, then it won. If it takes over, then it won. It's a complete virus. And, yeah. and I am just thrilled to see uh, the burgeoning organization that you're part of. And you've, you've got chapters all over America in a short time yeah. of people that uh, have uh, same sex attraction saying, look, don't you dare throw us on, in, 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 into this camp with, with you guys. And we're against everything you stand for and leave the kids alone. And I like the concept of groomer. Did you get that from uh, James Lindsay who was banned from Twitter for uh, calling, calling these people tw uh, groomers or, or was that? No, I mean the, the term groomer has been around for, for plenty of time, a long time. I don't know if you've ever seen, maybe not. Um, there is an interview with a, a man called Jack Reynolds, I believe his name is, and he was a convicted pedophile and he will tell you, that trying to get in good with the family and the child and, and f for the purpose of abuse and isolating them is called grooming. It's child grooming. When you, when you form this relationship with a child, you try to gain their trust for this purpose, it's grooming. And what people don't realize is that this agenda, this education that's come in is grooming on a mass scale. It's grooming the society to to turn the other way. It's grooming parents to put their kids in the hands of predators or potential predators, you know, because otherwise they'll be called a bigot if they don't do it. You know, it, it's it's very sinister. I I understand why some people don't want to see it because they want to believe that they're doing good. They want to believe that they're showing their kid love, that that they're accepting them, that they're giving them all this space. Um, but really, they're just they're just letting them into these vulnerable situations and potentially leading them into further abuse. I mean, and what's been interesting is to, to when I've been studying the the history of the gay community and when the the T got tacked on initially, I mean, I think it was just the the trans movement put their foot in the door of the gay movement because they they could understand the discrimination of it all. You know, the gay movement was like, okay, well, yeah. we know how it feels. We know how it feels to be discriminated against for for who you are or whatever. But there is a huge difference between who you're attracted to and what you identify as and how you feel. And that's what's so strange about all this in the first place. But then you have the root of the, the pedophilia of it all, if you will, um, gay gr groups like Nambla trying to get in good with the gay community and the majority of them rejected it. Um, but you do still have those groups that exist, which is disturbing. But when you look at what the agenda wants now, it lines up with beliefs of these pedophiles and these groups that have been around since like the seventies, eighties, you know, it's that they want youth liberation. They want kids to make their own decisions. They want, you know, the age of consent lowered. And, and it's almost like that's where this whole movement is going. I mean, that's basically is where this movement is going. Because if, if you let a child in, at any age before 18 suddenly decide that they want a sex change and do all this stuff to their body that they could 
potentially never undo, you might as well like hand them the, your car keys and the ability to vote and drink. I mean, it's the age restrictions exist for a reason. And when our, our brains aren't even really close to fully development until our mid twenties, maybe later, it's just, and everybody should know this. It's common sense. So it is such deception and so dark yeah, it that is. the parents are being encouraged to voluntarily subjugate their subject their kids in the name of oh i want to be a good person i want to be mm -hmm. tolerant i want to be accepting and their kids are being groomed right from under them and they're fully participatory and yeah. the the consequences that's that are coming down these parents are so deceived they're so confused their their first duty should be to protect that child not to expose them to perverse sexuality at yeah. seven eight nine years old yeah, it's it's awful. Sometimes younger too. I mean, and I got to um, take a look at Phoenix Pride over the weekend, which was, it happened so late in the year. And, and some people are like, "Pride's still going on." Yes, Pride Pride is, is still happening throughout the year. So that happened in Phoenix over the weekend, and um, I just I saw too many kids there, and a lot of groups that facilitate like youth groups and youth camps for these kids. You know, and then they had they would had a table of all these they them this that stuff on their on their table, and I just don't. I I thought this stuff would stay in the corners of the internet, and and instead the government and the education system have picked it up, and and they're just letting it happen. And and it's in the military too. That that one of the most disturbing things to me is that they've been doing they've been letting this happen, they've been letting this weaken the military. And there's just a lot of serious things can happen, you know, with cross-sex hormones and transitioning. It's not for the faint of heart. I, I, you know, if I respect your decision, if you want to do this as an adult, then it's sure later in life. Um, but to say that a child should be learning these things, I mean, it just, it's not going to help them solidify their sense of self and learn how to love who they are. And it, that's just going to cause chaos for them. What, what, what do you think the agenda, like what's fueling this? Who's behind it? Is it obviously demonic? Okay. So we can say the kingdom of darkness, but is there uh, an agenda that people up top are thinking or are they just like deceived or like, it just seems so bizarre uh, that this would yeah. be happening in, you know, in, in this time in, in America's history. Yeah, well, I mean, we're an empire only lasts for so long, and we're looking at around 250 years. We're more or less overdue for somewhat of a collapse, and the the financial situation we're in, economically, societally, like the division we have right now, and especially this gender confusion, they're all signs of like an, an imminent collapse, in my opinion, based on history. Because things tend to repeat themselves, you know, unless we learn, they repeat themselves. So that's what I see happening now. And a lot of it is coming from big pharma and people like the Pritzker family. There's so much funding coming from the Pritzker family. I recommend everybody look into that. Yeah. And we have an article on gazeagainstgroomers.com if you'd like. Um, it's it, following the money is is definitely a huge part of it when you see who's actually funding it it's all coming down from the top even the therapists are being retrained to essentially affirm instead of trying to find the root of things they're supposed to just sort of accept things at face value and a lot of these therapists are having sessions with these kids for like 45 minutes or an hour and just being like oh yeah you can have you can have surgeries and hormones here you go i'll sign off i'll recommend which is it's so alarming that because that is not enough time, things can happen to a person over the course of years to change who they are. I mean, I myself was sort of buying into the ideology because I was like struggling with, with self-hatred and discomfort in my own body. And, and that was happening to me in my mid twenties, you know? So the fact that this is happening to kids and they're introducing them to all these unnecessary superfluous concepts that just, it's not even grounded in reality and and you're it's not universally accepted but it's just the push of it all 
to try and make literally all of society accept this stuff. First of all, it's not going to happen. Second of all, it's damaging the gay community even more because now people are making this association with this agenda with all gay people as this negative. And I've seen more homophobia in the last couple of years than I ever saw growing up, ever. Probably because the general public might be linking uh, possible pedophilia with, with homosexuality. Yeah. Well, that's another thing is, uh, you know, we see we see these comments sometimes that are like, well, you opened the door. Well, you did this. And I don't really think that's fair to say because of everything no. that the gay community has gone through. There's a there's bad apples in every batch. I mean, you, you have all kinds of pedophiles, men, women. It doesn't matter that the, these things happen to any community there are, you know, you can have your extremists in any community. And obviously the majority doesn't like that. We don't like that. We don't want to associate with that, you know, and, but that's, you know, we try to do our best to differentiate and the weird, the phenomenon that's happening is we say that we're gays against groomers and then people say, oh, well, you're anti-gay then. So the implication that you make by saying that is you're saying all gays are groomers and that is insulting, it's wow. not true, and it's not okay. So, you know, we're, we're doing our best to get through this, this blatant just character assassination that, you know, some, some trans a activists the the extreme tra uh if you will wrote our wikipedia page and we can't edit it we can't take it down we can't do anything to it and it's pretty much 100 percent lies down to our funding and who we are and who created us so it's it's aggravating you know when you have to deal with yeah. that kind of opposition when you people make assumptions based on a Wikipedia page, which is, I was told in high school never to use Wikipedia as a source because you can change it, because it can be hijacked. Everybody should know that. And that's, it's so irritating, <laughs> you know, but it makes me feel like I'm at least on the right track, I guess, at the, at the end of the day. But um, it's been hard to, to see that this, this happening to the gay community, because I know that plenty of them are just good people. They want to have normal lives, you know, um, and a lot of them sort of regret ever fighting for gay marriage because at this point it's like well you know we got it in 2015 and it's almost like it was it, it was kind of a now what moment and the government didn't have anything to capitalize on so there was this reinvention and this this door opened and and all this stuff that like i said i thought would stay in the dark corners of the internet um just busted out into real life and so, it, again, I started to trace things back to who was funding this. And that's a huge part of it as well, is the money of it all. But I, I'm just glad that we're, we're speaking up. We're saying something about it. We're doing something about it. We've got chapters in about, almost half the country now. And um, it's been a trip. It just... Well, you know what's shocking is... Uh... Who would have thought there would be an organization only dedicated to protect the hypersexualization of children, the violation of children, mm -hmm. uh, protect them from being permanently damaged in their body, protected in their minds, and to not sexualize children? Forget the gay part. Any organization that stand for that up until recently. Now, I understand like your organization has been defunded, deplatformed because you want to protect children. I mean, what, what other reason could there be? I, I don't know. Like I said, when, when people try to say we're anti-gay, I, I can't wrap my mind around that because I literally, I know these, I, I know the members, I know the people that are in it. I know the, like there's multiple gay couples and we're all friends with each other and we all know where we, everybody comes from. and you know, we have people from different backgrounds, like not just gay people, like, you know, you have, have, it just, it's so strange to see the assumptions made and, um, the things that people try to say to us to, to discredit us. And, and then they also say that we have like these huge, huge donors from like the heritage foundation, completely untrue. I'm not, cause I'm not on the secretary of the board now. I've yeah. seen the numbers. I know where the donations are coming from. And it's 
it's frustrating because, you know, I, and that's when I kind of just like give it to God. I'm like, well, we, you'll see when, when the taxes come out and it's all going to be public, you're going to, you're going to have to eat your own words. So I just try to block the noise out because we know what we're doing is right. Yeah. And and I, I want to encourage anybody who might be homosexual or same sex attraction, stand up and join this group, uh, protect children. I always thought that, uh, my demographic was a source of all evil on the planet, cisgender, white, Christian, male. And it's no, it's just this wokeism hates everything that doesn't bow the knee to it. It doesn't matter if you're female or black or, or LGBTQ. It doesn't matter if you're a feminist, they're coming for you and they're coming yeah. for every group, every, every family. So yeah. th this cult is coming for you. And if you're hearing my voice, it's time for you to stand up and uh, just say enough. We, we, this is not love. This, you know, uh, and uh, there's a guy named Karl Popper uh, wrote a book called Open Society, ironically enough, uh, Soros's organization. And he says for a liberal democracy to exist, uh, we must be tolerant to everybody until there are certain members in that society that are intolerant. In that point, everybody who's been tolerant needs to stand up against them and we must be intolerant to them. And we need to put them down. They are the minority. They're gaining strength and everybody's afraid of these woke cults. You know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, stand up to it. Please stand up to it. Donate to this organization. Get involved. Make your voice be heard and do not do not cower because you're not being loving. You're not being, you're not being helpful. You're causing destruction. The more yeah. th this virus will take over everything. So if you hear me, please uh, get involved and, and stand and stand up for truth, stand up for life. It's a death cult and it's causing so much destruction. So I, I'd like to pivot because you've mentioned Matt several times and Matt yeah. is your spouse. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've read on your blog uh, just some re really tough time uh, that Matt in particular has been going through, but you as uh, as uh, Matt's uh, spouse, uh, maybe I, I think it would be important for you to to share with our audience because Matt transitioned, but th then decided that they weren't satisfied with the transition and decided to detransition and has gone through a lot. And so I'm going to open up this question by saying to you, knowing what you know now and knowing how much you love Matt, hypothetically, if you met Matt for the first time and you developed this love for Matt and they were considering transitioning, what would you say to them if you met them 10 years ago, knowing what you both know now? Well, I would say that the doctors are going to lie to you because they did. They lied to Matt. Um, Matt tested having 10 times more testosterone than a woman should have naturally before all this. So Matt was told, oh, you must be intersex, but they didn't actually properly test for that. And we found that out a little later as well. Um, I would say that if you do this, your increased uh, risk of a heart attack is going to go way up, way more than they'll tell you. And if you ever switch brands for any reason of testosterone, you're going to get sick. And I would say that, you know, the top surgery might not go super well because it didn't. And, you know, I would make Matt aware of the things that, that could happen that have happened now. Um, you know, and it's, it's been tough because I know that Matt has struggled with this, this gender dysphoria, they call it, um, since, very young. And that was well before any of this agenda was around us. This was when we were kids. We're in our thirties now. So this was way before any of this stuff had hit the mainstream. And so, you know, Matt's mom was told she was having a boy and she didn't. And then Matt tested with really high testosterone. So that's, you know, that's been interesting. And I can understand where the dysphoria might come from like hormonally, mm -hmm. but that can also come from PCOS polycystic ovary syndrome. And I don't believe that was something the doctors tested for. What, what, what does that mean? I, I've, I've never heard of that word. Um, polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, you can test high testosterone if you have, basically, if your your ovaries are out of whack, you can get cysts. It can make you really mm -hmm. sick um, and, and imbalance you. Um, even I don't know as much as I should, but I do know that that 
polycystic ovary syndrome can cause high testosterone in women. So um, it can cause problems with your reproductive system. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to beg and plead Matt not to do it because I still respect, you know, people's choices. If it really, you really feel like it's something you need to do, okay, but you have to know what can happen. Mm. And the other thing is Matt was also watching a lot of people on, on like YouTube that were, that was, um, they were going through it. And so I think at one point that encouraged Matt as well. And I, you know, I would just, I would say like, Hey, once your voice breaks, it's not going back. Once you're, you start growing facial hair, you're not going to just stop growing it. You know, and so it's something you have to be really, really, really sure that you want to do. And even then, I mean, I just don't believe that it, it's more, to me, it's more of a body modification. You know, you're not, you're, you're presenting as something, but biologically you're another. And I've always thought that's what being transsexual is. I've never had a problem with that. You know, I still respect people as individuals. If that makes you happy, okay, but just don't lie about how you were born about, you know, what, what you did. And, and don't, don't say that this fully makes you a woman now because it just doesn't, you know, like I, I just, and that's always been my stance. So when people started to straight up deny reality and say, well, you can be whatever you feel. I was like, well, no, you can't, you can, you could get implants or get this taken out or get this change or that, but it does not change who you are on a molecular level. Yes. And I've never, and like I said, I thought that was just common sense. I thought that was just the truth. That's how, in my mind, that's how transsexuals live. It was like, okay, well, I was born a man. Well, I was born a woman. Okay. You know, and then we move on, you know, and you don't focus on it that much. But now they've made such a, just a circus out of it that I feel obligated to speak up, you know, and I, I'm not... I think even Matt has said if, if he knew what he knew now that maybe he wouldn't have gone through with it, but it is what it is, you know, it's done. And I think that, it, you know, I know Matt's not taking testosterone now, but detransitioning I think is, has been really difficult. It's not a snap back. It's, it's like I said, it's not going to just go back to the way it was. It's done. What, what are some of the, the symptoms that Matt struggled with the last year uh, as a result of, getting off trend, uh, uh, artificial trend, uh, testosterone. Well, the scariest thing has been um, some seizure-like activity, which apparently can happen from imbalanced hormones. And when we went to a hormone specialist in Phoenix, Matt was told um, that the hormone levels were simultaneously a pregnant woman, a menopausal woman, and a postmenopausal woman, post -menopausal woman all at the same time. Oh. So... Um, there's a lot that comes with that, you know, mood swings, acne, fatigue, um, pain in your, in your bones. Um, it's, it's been really hard, you know, like just bouts of insomnia or just difficulty doing things day to day. Um, yeah, it's, it's really been hard because we just, there's no path for detransitioners. So we've had to try a combination of like, hormone prescriptions to try to correct some of it and some holistic stuff to just encourage the body to heal um and get through it so there is like i said there's just there's no clear path all these doctors they want these kids to transition so bad but hmm. then things can happen even a decade down the line and they're not checking in with doctors as much you, you know and everything could go south after when you when you think it's all going to be fine because that's kind of what happened to matt like when we met, um, Matt was about like a month or two out from getting the top surgery. So, you know, there was, that was done. And the thing is, Matt had been binding and chest binding can, um, it basically is kind of gateway behavior to needing top surgery because you essentially can damage your breast tissue so bad that you kind of have to get the surgery. So. I try to warn people about that too. Chest binding can be really dangerous. Well, we we all know that our wonderful American Academy of so uh, Medical Association, our wonderful uh, American Pediatric Association, WPATH, they're all more than happy to line up kids for puberty blockers and, you know, 
accelerated uh, gender transformations. And they've got this all down to a science, supposedly. So our wonderful medical establishment, my question is, how, how equipped are they and how prepared are they to help people who decide, you know what, I, I tried this and, and now I want to go back to the way I was born. What kind of support have you gotten from the medical establishment? And what, what's, what are their wonderful plans to, to help people like Matt and thousands of others that realize that they made a mistake? I don't think the medical industry is, knows what's coming. Um, I think there's going to be a big wave of detransitioners in the next five to 10 years after all this is said and done. And they're going to have to scramble through lawsuits and, and, you know, hormone specialists. They're going to need more hormone specialists. There are not enough of them. They, and, and I just don't think doctors know enough about hormones, period. They don't. And it can mess with your mental health so much. That's what's so crazy to me is like you're, you're talking to these kids and saying, well, if I don't, if I don't let them do this, then they're going to, they're going to kill themselves. Like they're, you know, they're mentally distressed. So let them do this. Okay. What happens when they realize that they've done something that they can't undo that they're not happy with? How great do you think their mental health is going to be then? How much resentment do you think they're going to have for the adults around them that let this happen, that enabled this to happen? Yes. You know, why would you risk that? You know, because you, if, and if your child is suffering mentally like that, get them more therapy, but don't take the medical route. Just try to figure out the root cause. You know, is it the kids around them? Is it the things they're watching? You know, parents aren't monitoring a whole lot of, of device usage or, you know, social media or anything like that. And just since smartphones really exploded, you know, in, the, in probably since I just got out of high school in like 2009, kids' mental health is just diving. And I think a lot of it has to do with social media and technology and, and comparing ourselves to people online. I mean, especially girls. Um, girls are having the, some of the worst of it. I think. Yes. And I, I recommend a documentary called Cut Daughters of the West by Simon Esler. He's a Canadian director. He took a really deep dive into that specifically, how the trans movement is kind of more or less destroying womanhood. And it's so much harder on girls. I mean, mm -hmm. we already had to live through the skinny model era of, of girls feeling bad about themselves, not being feminine enough, not doing this or that or this. Throw in the trans stuff throw in, Oh, well, if you don't like it, you can just be a man, but that's not true. Uh, you know? How is this a wonderful, wonderful trans cult? Uh, the ones that are so noble and so full of uh, acceptance and affirmation and tolerance. How have they treated Matt ever since Matt yeah. decided, you know what? I want to go in a different direction. How have they treated you as Matt's uh, partner? Oh, I've been told that I'm transphobic. I've been told that I'm horrible, abusive, because I don't recognize Matt as a man through and through, or I use the wrong pronouns, or when this and that, the other thing. Matt's been kind of treated like a pariah. Same as Chloe Cole. You know, sometimes people just tell Matt, well, oh, well, you, you did this, so that now you, you made your bed, now you have to lie in it, and that's your fault, and who cares? Go die. Um, you know, and, and it's disgusting really i mean kind of shocking i mean you don't see it as as much at these days we're not getting as much of it but yeah over time matt's been told the, the most ridiculous stuff you know and and so have i i've been told that i'm transphobic when i literally married someone who transitioned and has just been dealing with the pain of it and i think a big part of it was um switching over to a, a testosterone brand called cipionate i'm hearing that's making a lot of trans men specifically mm -hmm. sick so, um, but that just proves that this medical stuff is all kind of an experiment. You know, you're taking such a huge risk. Why would you put a child at risk? It makes me so angry and I'm re really sorry that you, you two are going through that. It's horrible. Thank you. Yeah. And so Judith, I, uh, I really thank you for being vulnerable coming on the show. I, I bless you. And I, I just think you're doing great work and I know that, uh, it's been a very transforming four or five years for you. Mm -hmm. And so I want to give you the last word and let people know how they can get a hold of you to support you, your wonderful work and, uh, and wh where you're going in the future. So I'd like you to give a word of exhortation to our audience and just speak from your heart and uh, may God continue to bless you. Thank you so much. And I, and I just want to say to maybe some of the, 
slightly more uptight religious crowd. Um, we have to work together on this. I understand maybe you you don't approve of certain lifestyle choices or whatever it is, however you want to look at it. But um, we are the bridge. You know, the, the, we're going to have to join hands to end this abuse against children. And I just I just want people to kind of see the big picture, set our differences aside, see what's most important. Um, you, you know, the the gay movement's not contagious. You can still you can still show love and, and support. But uh, it's time to to speak up and stop letting this fear narrative control us. And, and again, like I said, zoom out. And, and see that the, the real enemy is the people who are making us fight each other, are making us look down our noses at each other. I mean, even I, I have compassion even for the people that are still lost in it because I, I know where they're at. I know that they're in some ways they're trying to do good and they think that they're doing good. But, um, you know, we just need to have more compassion to it for each other and see where this is really headed and prioritize. You know, so th that's just what I'd like to say. And as far as um, as far as getting in touch with me and, and following me, I, I have a little link tree. If you go to my Twitter, Judith Rose ninety one, or my Instagram, Hey Judith, I think it's Hey Jude Rose or Hey Judith Rose. Sorry, I, I had to change it at one point because I lost my original account, which was discouraging at one point. But um, yeah, it is Hey Judith Rose on Instagram. I update my Instagram story fairly often. I'm also on Truth Social. I think the same name. And um, you can also email me if you'd really like to. It's heyjuderose at protonmail.com. I was, I, you can still find my podcast, uh, I believe, on my Patreon if you'd like. It, I'm not doing it so much anymore um, because I've just been so focused on my personal life and, and the work that I'm doing. So, you know, as a director of communications, I'm doing a lot. I'm doing press releases. I write speeches. Uh, I write blogs, tweets, uh, what, you know, to respond to emails, this, that, the other thing. So. It's a lot, and I really appreciate the support. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having the space and, and listening. And um, I just want everyone to to stand up. It's time, you know. Our, our morals should be first before anything else. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. You take care, Judith. Thank you. Appreciate you.